Good day to everybody. We open our roundtable discussion on the uh, problem of uh, quite actual topic uh, on genocide and genocides, not directly, but we are going to discuss uh, the term and different aspects of instrumentalization and politization of the term. First of all, um, we, I mean, uh, Academic Bridges Laboratory, our aim is to present the most topical questions and discussions in contemporary uh, scholarship beyond uh, state censorship borders. Uh, I am a moderator of today's discussion and you can address your questions uh, either to me or to our um, uh, Noah Adamov, you can see uh, the icon and logotype here, uh, or you can, after uh, the discussion, you can address your questions to speakers. Uh, and of course, <laughs> you are able to rename uh, yourselves, if you like an ID. Uh, today we have really starting and well-known team of researchers uh, who are our guests. Um, I would like to introduce you to you, uh, Georgi Kasyanov. He is a professor head of the laboratory of International Memory Studies of uh, the University Maria Curie in Poland. Uh, then Suren Manukian, who is uh, the head of Department of Comparative Genocide Studies uh, and uh, the uh, research of Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute and head of UNESCO chair on prevention of uh, genocide. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Konstantin Pakhaluk here who is affiliated researcher fellow uh, of Beza, Prog uh, Beza Center at Barilan University in Israel and uh, Victor Wachstein, uh, also well-known co-founder of the International Institute <laughs> of Social Legal Studies and senior researcher uh, at Tel Aviv University in Israel. And uh, now we are proceeding to our short statements, short presentations of um, um, first of um, Suren Manukian and Victor Wachstein, and then uh, the floor will take uh, Georgi Kasyanov and Konstantin Pahaluk. So you are welcome, Suren. Wow. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity. Do you hear me well? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, yes. yes. And uh, uh, I think it's it's a very, very actual topic. It's very relevant, unfortunately, for all of us, because we usually speak about genocide as something historical. But unfortunately, even now at, the, at this at very moment, we're talking about uh, the Genocide Convention, 
We have a lot of ongoing mass atrocities, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. And um, so uh, today, I, I, I want just very, very briefly present my, my thoughts, my ideas about the difficulties in implementation of genocide convention. And uh, I think the first thing, I will focus on four uh, points. I think those are uh, important and, and relevant for today's discussion. I think the, the first thing is that the conceptual framework and uh, legal definition of genocide underwent significant changes during the very discussions uh, uh, as the UN is political structure and the documents is adopts uh, reflect not only legal, but also the diverse political approaches uh, of its member states. And this uh, adjust, uh, adjustment took nearly two years to finalize, finalize. If we remember how hardly Rafael Lemke struggled for the adoption of Genocide Convention and for the uh, uh, finalizing his, his ideas in this document. Um, and uh, however, the timing was ideal for the uh, adoption of such document at that time because new international organization and legal instruments were, uh, were being established and horrific evidence of Nazi crimes was being revealed. Uh, in particular, the information of uh, and photographs of concentration camps uh, created favorable conditions for the adoption of, this, of, of these documents, um, as they helped to overcome the absolute stance uh, on state sovereignty, which was often used as a shield against international intervention and humanitarian um, intrusion. Um, the, this extremely complex issue was successfully, of course, uh, resolved by uh, Rafael Lemkin, working and working alone without a team and guided by a clear goal and plan to achieve it. But at the same time, and now I'm coming to my second comment, uh, this um, convention is full of flaws, full of vague points, and uh, uh, those could, could be used for, for states to avoid uh, participate to avoid preventing um, the crime that was uh, coined by Raphael Lemkin. Um, and uh, the, the difficulties in applying these documents are twofold, both objective and subjective and have legal and, po and, and political components. The objective difficulties stem from the need to clearly distinguish genocide from the other mass atrocities uh, mass crimes and crimes against humanity, and significantly the intent to commit genocide holds central importance in this re regard. Yet it, it also creates serious challenges in proving that, that, that intent. Uh, if, we, if we remember, article, the second article of the convention uh, says that in the in convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy. And um, and so the definition, the very definition of genocide requires that the perpetrator have a specific state of mind, the intent to destroy a group. And genocidal intent must be based on facts and circumstances. Uh, and I argue that, and not only me, but 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 many scholars argue that the greatest setback of the of convention is um, this requirement of genocidal intent that is nearly impossible to prove. In some instances, of course, regimes do follow the Nazi example and announce beforehand uh, that they are determined to conduct a campaign of uh, extermination. For example, in Rwanda, you remember that uh, Hutu uh, militants or politicians, they use the radio to direct uh, show or, or to, 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 di to direct um, uh, perpetrators to sites where their victims could be found and massacres, massacred. However, most governments are more sophisticated, of course, and try not to leave such incriminating evidence for future prosecutors to find. And I don't know, honestly, why the drafters of the convention included this notion uh, as they were aware of, of, of that potential loophole. In other words, uh, a government could assert that even if actions uh, by, by its forces had contributed to deaths of thousands of members of particular group, they did not mean genocide had been committed 
uh, and all the government, all all the perpetrated government government uh, um, uh, do so do uh, did so and 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 is doing now. Um, I don't know. For example, the Turkish government still for for the case has argued that yes, the deaths uh, up of up to 1.5 million Armenians in 1915. Yes, they happened, but it was not genocide, but rather came about because of civil unrest that broke out during the First World War. And they, they didn't have just intent to, to, to kill these people. So we cannot call it genocide. And I think this, this point of intent is, is the, 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 uh, the, the grievous set, uh, flow of this convention. And taking seriously this interpretation is vi virtually impossible to satisfy with uh, with evidence. Also, we have other other vague points. We have other uh, problems here. Uh, I don't want to go deeper to detail, but just one or two points to uh, to uh, show what what I mean. The first one, for example, another uh, point, for example, the phrase "killing the group in whole or in part." Also, it, it has been subject of, uh, of to much discussion by scholars and international humanitarian law because uh, you cannot uh, kind of measure what does it mean in part, what part should be killed to call what 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 happened uh, genocide, and um, and uh, um, of course here we can suggest some solutions. For example, maybe put another word to make uh, to modify to read. I don't know in whole or in substantial part, but or something along along these lines. But um, unfortunately, uh, this convention never was modified. This convention never was was, was refined, and this is another point I wanted to uh, I wanted to to, uh, to stress on. Um, my, my third uh, idea or my first uh, thesis I wanted I wanted to point that. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to due the lack of appropriate mechanisms and structures in international law, the issue of holding perpetrators accountable for crimes, even those recognized by international courts, is not always resolved. And uh, uh, now uh, we cannot just bring these people, or uh, we don't know, or. Uh, we don't have uh, this uh, uh, punishing mechanism very well, very well described and detailed to uh, to uh, make the process of punishment of perp uh, perpetrators of genocide inevitable. Um, and um, uh, usually, the actual killers during the genocide uh, are acquitted on the basis of that they were not aware of the total extermination scheme. Uh, decided by political and military leadership. Uh, the leaders are often then acquitted for not committing the genocide acts th themselves because they never killed anyone personally. And uh, furthermore, and, and uh, I think it's, it's um, uh, of course, states have some obligations and this, uh, these obligations encompass two actions prevent and punish, prevention and punishment. Uh, but the, the convention does not contain mechanism for implementation. Uh, the first action or criteria for identifying the threat of genocide at that, st at that stage. As a result, while uh, prevention is of critical importance, the convention does not provide real means for the eff effective implementation. And this was my, my third uh, point. And, uh, um, 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 also, what I wanted uh, to add here, the need to refine uh, these factors that reduce the effectiveness of the convention uh, is, is, is evident. Nevertheless, even during favorable moments, such as the period when the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted, and when uh, the definitions of other international crimes, such as crimes against humanity and war crimes, were being revised, no significant changes were made to the definition of genocide. And another, another uh, moment that over 15 countries have not ratified the existing convention. 
Uh, therefore, the political component will continue to have substantial influence on the application of the convention in the future. At my last point, my last thesis, I wanted just to bring um, to your attention for, for discussion. Um, after the Holocaust, after Rwanda, after Cambodia, Bosnia, and Darfur, many dreamed of a world without genocide and mass atrocities. And the goal uh, has not been achieved. Um, as ongoing violence, violent conflict shows, significant change has occurred, of course, in the way citizens and policymakers now approach the topic. And in the number of cases, uh, uh, we saw that global actors have responded collectively uh, to, uh, to the onset of genocides and mass atrocities. Uh, and we even have some successful cases, if we can call them successful, Kosovo case, we can call, we can uh, remind the case of Kenya, then international international intervention, uh, diplomatic intervention helped to stop massacres, or the case of Cote d'Ivoire, there were also uh, regional organizations, they mobilized uh, their resources, their capacities, and, and stopped ongoing violence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for every Kosovo, there is uh, I don't know, uh, there is a, a Ukraine. For for every uh, Kenya, there is, a, I don't know, Nagorno-Karabakh that happened last year. And in other words, uh, uh, the global response to the to the onset of atrocities is, sti is still uh, un uh, uh, uneven. Um, and the response is shaped by geostrategic considerations, mostly uh, more than by moral responsibilities of the states and um, and by real constraints to what authorities and, and citizens can do in any given situations. In short, the dream of never again is more inside than ever before because we have just formal, we have conventions, we have these mechanisms uh, uh, described somewhere, but the reality is still some distance away. So this was my, these were my, my, my uh, ideas I'm, uh, I am ready to discuss uh, during our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Suren, for, uh, for your statement, for uh, presenting your statement in this difference, bit break between theory and practice, and um, you have set more questions than answers uh, for us to discuss. Uh, I think uh, the next floor is for Victor Wachstein to add okay. or refute the statement. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my position will be completely different uh, about this, exactly because the concept of intent is probably the most important part of the very definition and conceptualization of genocide. Uh, but first, we probably need to notice that there are totally different uh, usages of this uh, concept of genocide. Genocide lives a uh, double life. It plays in two different fields. One is a part of legal discussion, uh, and as a legal term, genocide has a clear definition uh, that was given by Lemkin. Actually, uh, we all remember that in his book, 1944, about uh, crimes of uh, access powers in Europe, uh, he suggested a broader definition of genocide, uh, but then it was narrowed in order to make it more consistent and implementable. So uh, in terms of legal understanding, we at least can try to see what kind of evolution that concept uh, uh, undertook uh, during the last uh, 60 years, more than 60 years, uh, also because of different precedents, of course, uh, Srebrenica uh, uh, and so and so on. Uh, on the other hand, we have a genocide as a popular term, as a part of media uh, and uh, public debate, where accusation in genocide is um, is like greetings. Hello, you are a genocide state. Uh, so it's a part of very widespread public discussion where the very idea of genocide probably is not um, viable anymore. 
So uh, why intent is so important? Uh, as we remember, uh, in Lemkin's terms, there are two different um, specific features of the very phenomenon of genocide. So first, people who are killed, who are murdered, are supposed to belong to some particular social group, ethnic, racial, confessional, and so on, religious group, uh, and sometimes even territorial, ethnic territorial group. Uh, and they uh, are murdered only because they belong to that group, not because of any other reason. So if tomorrow Putin will decide to kill all uh, oppositioners in Russia, it won't be a genocide because there is no such race as opposition and there is no such religion as uh, Russian opposition. Uh, the other part is about intent. It should be clear intent to commit a genocide, to destroy that group uh, in part or in total. Uh, why it's important? Because this idea of intent uh, has um, is connected with the two uh, uh, very uh, clear legal axioms, legal statements. First, uh, it's connected with the idea of conspiracy. It was very important in 1945 in Nuremberg uh, to use this idea of conspiracy in order to, uh, to have a trial on Nazi regime as a whole, as a political body. Uh, otherwise, it should be like many, many different trials where each uh, Nazi uh, officer should be judged separately. But no, as soon as we use this concept of conspiracy, it means a collective body and collective action. And collective action should have collective intent. That's why Van Zee conference is so important. Otherwise, it's not a um, mm, political body. It's just very single uh, mm, implementers. And second, why it's important, because there is something as a called standard of proof. Uh, and the genocide is a crime of crimes. And now, if you want to prove that it was a genocide, you need to present your proofs by the highest possible standard, which means beyond the reasonable doubt. As soon as you are lowering this standard, saying something like uh, Judge Shahabadin in 2001, uh, when he was uh, considering this case against Goran Yelisic, um, who was a Serbian field commander accused in genocide, um, uh, he, he, was, he was found guilty, but not in genocide. And uh, Judge Shahabadin said, unfortunately, in the middle of war, uh, in the fog of war, we cannot apply that standard beyond reasonable doubt because no evidences of collective intent, no Van Zee conference, which means that this accusation of genocide is unsustainable. We have to um, use other accusations. So uh, as soon as we are trying to put away the concept of intent, anything, literally anything, any episode of war, can be considered as genocide. So living that, dropping that concept of intent means weaponizing the very idea of genocide and, and the end killing the idea of genocide. Uh, that's why intent is important and that's why intent is still in place. No matter how many people were trying to attack the conceptualization of genocide proposed by Lemkin, uh, some of them tried to lower the standard of proof saying that beyond a reasonable doubt is uh, is impossible during the war. Some people like Francesca Albanese recently tried to add not only the uh, to this concept of intent, another concept of capacity, ability, saying that yes, if people are murdering other people because they hate their racial or uh, religious group, but they don't have enough capacity, ability to destroy them all, then it shouldn't be considered as genocide. A genocidal attack because yes they have intention and yes they killed but they anyway smaller less armed so they wouldn't be able to do it anyway that's why it shouldn't be considered a genocidal attack so there are plenty of different attacks on the concept of genocide today uh, with a clear intention to make it a weapon of political uh, statement to make it a weapon of war but probably the only thing that's still in place and still 
holds this as a legal concept, not just a part of accusations, is the idea of intent. So I can talk a lot about uh, this evolution of the concept of genocide that started by Jean-Paul Sartre in his famous speech in 1968, when first the idea of genocide was taken away from this critique of totalitarianism and repressive regimes and became part of post-colonial discourse and anti-colonial rhetoric. But that's probably will, will lead us too far. So I will try to keep it short now and save some time for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, for arguments that you brought. And uh, it also opens some perspectives uh, to the further discussion. And now I give a floor to Georgi Kasyanov to discuss um, another aspects of genocide in uh, political constructions. Thank you. I just uh, would like to follow the template you sent to us uh, for this seminar and uh, to answer first briefly answer questions you put on this template. Uh, how can scholars conduct comparative studies of different types of mass violence? I think that the only possible nor decent way of uh, uh, studying mass violence is a comparative studies. So that's the time of comparative studies, uh, particularly for genocides. Then can we avoid the inflation of term genocide? Uh, we we cannot avoid it because it's already a reality. The term genocide is inflated by politicians in many, in various ways, and uh, we have to deal with this and uh, we have to overcome this somehow. At least that's academic discussions. Then, uh, which historical examples help uh, or hinder discussions of genocide today? No, just uh, every historical example would be appropriate for the above-mentioned comparative studies of genocide. And then uh, why do certain states come to the intention to invention of their proper genocides as a part of their politics of memory? It's also unavoidable that, uh, well, since politicians use term genocide in different perspectives, so that's a, uh, I would say, natural part of any particularly for some nations who are at the period, uh, now at the period of state building, they definitely would use some kind of this terminology of this wording to uh, enhance their, uh, their uh, identity building narrative. And then how colonialism and genocide policies are or could be connected, that's uh, they already connected. If you look, if you look, look through to, uh, the historical Streit Zwei, the, the, the second historical Streit in Germany, which is unfolding now, then you, you will see how exactly colonialism and genocide issues are entangled and interconnected and how they mutual, mutually influence each other. And then now I'm going to uh, the uh, Ukrainian case. And uh, of course, for Ukrainian case, and uh, the case of using and misusing the concept of genocide is a state policies and, and uh, state memory policies and uh, uh, I would say identity building policies around the issue of the Great Famine of 32-33, which is a which could serve as a um, exemplary case of use the term of term and the concept of genocide uh, in these policies. Exactly in the middle of 80s, uh, during the work of uh, the Special Commission of the Congress of the United States, uh, which focused on the Great Famine of 33 in Ukraine, the major, one of the primary uh, conclusions of this commission was that uh, the great Ukrainian famine, the, the Ukrainian famine was a was an act of genocide of Ukrainians? Of course, it was contextualized, definitely contextualized by the political agenda. But if you look at the 
uh, at the origins of uh, the concept of genocide, it also was contextualized and driven by political agenda, uh, by post uh, post uh, war situation and the situation with the condemnation of Nazism and and the slogan which emerged a bit later, "Never again," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, I think that uh, when, as academics, we try to um, somehow to, to contextualize and to place um, the use of the term genocide, we should uh, do this in uh, using and understanding the historical context and uh, intentions of uh, those who promote the, the concept in this historical context. So uh, this politically driven and politically loaded concept came to the territory of Ukraine uh, at the end of the 80s during the Soviet times. And uh, exactly at this time, academi academics started to, Ukraine academics at uh, mainland Ukraine started to deal with the concept of genocide in its relation to uh, the Great Famine, which at this time in the end of 80s and beginning of 90s, received the new term, uh, the, the term Holodomor. So that uh, uh, since then, I will use the term Holodomor to uh, both to descri describe the historical event and uh, interpretation of this event. So I think that the first, the, uh, first, um, first academic article uh, where the term genocide was used uh, in connection with the Holodomor was published in 1990, and um, that was exactly about the concept, the the UN Convention and the applicability of UN Convention to uh, to uh, Ukrainian case, and the answer was positive. And since then, uh, it became first at the level of academic historiography and at um, I would say at public discussions, the idea that Holodomor was genocide of Ukrainians and uh, not the banner of ethnic Ukrainians. So uh, that idea uh, dominated the uh, historiography and uh, public discussions. Of course, there were also opponents to this ideas, uh, to this idea, opponents, political opponents. Of course, they were left, they were communists, they were, or I would call them post-communist because they called communists, but they were not Ideologically, well, that was just a kind of umbrella for the what for uh, other interests. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, and then in thousands there was also the party of, of big capital, uh, party of regions, who also objected the use term genocide uh, uh, in application to to Holodomor. Uh, anyway, uh, at the level of public opinion at uh, the dominating public opinion, at the level of academic historiography, the term genocide um, concerning the uh, Holodomor uh, was, became a dominant. And here, the, the major problem was that when, it's, when this uh, tendency started, the, the whole evidence, the academics started to gather evidence accordingly to this formula, Holodomor's genocide. And that was a big problem for, uh, for, uh, for academia because in this case, everything which did not coincide with the genocidal concept of Holodomor was either ignored or rejected. And then, uh, which by the way, does not uh, mean that uh, those who professed the genocidal version that they did not good academic job. They did. They they collected a huge empirical evidence. They just made made this historical event uh, visible. They presented it to the world, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, nevertheless, once again, that uh, there were certain limitations in uh, in this process. Uh, of course, this process was um, can be considered when. Uh, when I say about the uh, forming the dominant discourse, of course, it was a part of nation building project and uh, the identity building project. So that's nothing new here. It's uh, it's normal procedure for every nation which builds its own national identity. Of course, within this national identity should be 
a, a, a kind of central tragedy. And by this time, the concept of genocide also becoming very popular in, in academia in the West. So the genocide studies in the 90s flourishing, and there, there was about more than 1,000 chairs of genocide and Holocaust studies in the US, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a part of the world's trend. And nevertheless, at the level of, his, of the state politics, the genocide uh, concept, genocide version of all of the more became a must after 2006 when the special memory law was, uh, uh, was passed by the Ukrainian parliament. And since then, official uh, official verbiage, uh, official official uh, discourse was based exclusively on the uh, representation of Holodomor as genocide. What is interesting is that after that, after 2006, there were about 14 attempts. Well, I calculate, I, I found uh, 14 attempts to introduce special law on uh, Holodomor denial and uh, 12 of these attempts were focused on the idea of criminalizing the Holodomor, uh, the Holodomor denial as a genocide. So criminalizing not the denial as such, but criminalizing the denial of interpretation, a certain interpretation. And uh, all these uh, attempts failed. And uh, uh, so, but uh, the last was in 2020. Now this uh, idea of Voldemort's genocide, of course, received new impetus from, uh, well, due to the situation, due to the war, and uh, there is a trend now in uh, Western scholarship and in Ukrainian scholarship to consider the, uh, the war, Russian war against Ukraine, as a genocidal war. There are pros, there are contrasts against this, but generally there is a kind of consensus among certain part of scholars that it is this war has a genocidal character. And uh, if you follow the uh, legal practices and you see the order uh, warrant uh, uh, issued uh, for Putin, and this is exactly one of the reasons for this is one of the components of genocide is that uh, the children, Ukrainian children, are deported to Russia, and then uh, then uh, they uh, it's it's one of uh, uh, indicators of genocidal practices. And final point is that having uh, Ukraine promoting the idea of genocide, of uh, Holodomor's genocide, at the same time does not recognize, uh, for instance, Armenian genocide, also for purely political reasons. When you read official comments on this, when Armenian, for instance, Armenian community of Kiev uh, appeals to authorities about recognition of Armenian genocide, uh, they received uh, they receive, uh, responses poli based politically on purely on political considerations that uh, we do not want to spoil a relationship with Turkey. And another genocide, another uh, uh, external conflict about the uh, use of the term genocide is, of course, Ukrainian-Polish relations when the Volinian massacre uh, con committed by Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and Ukrainian Insurgent Army in 43-44 in, uh, in Volinia, in German-occupied Volinia. So they, uh, of course, it's, 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 a, it's a red flag for Ukrainian politicians when Poles call it genocide. And Poles did it, and they Poles call it genocide in 2016 when they, uh, their same, their parliament, adopted special resolution calling this massacre a genocide. So it's very controversial and the concept is very controversial. The concept, I believe personally, is not, uh, I, I, I don't think that it is good for uh, academic use. It's very, it's great for political use, for ideological, etc. But I believe that uh, for academic use it is very much inappropriate. At this point, I would stop. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. And um, your last point was, or oh, partly answered my future questions also. And um, 
now I think that Konstantin Pahaluk um, uh, might um, bring similar arguments or maybe more controversial arguments and perspectives discussing um, just neighboring case. Uh, Konstantin, the uh, floor is thank, yours. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I would like to speak about so-called genocide of Soviet people that was already nowadays in Russia and Europe. Uh, that is used to justify the war against Ukraine. But still, I want to make some remarks about uh, the definition of um, uh, genocide. Of course, uh, we, we, we've just uh, uh, remembered uh, Lemkin and his definition, but we need to understand that his own definition of genocide is quite different from those adopted uh, in 1948 uh, uh, under the UN uh, uh, Convention. I, uh, I totally agree with uh, Viktor Wachstein that is, uh, one of the more important of genocide is about uh, intent. You have an intent to kill people. But still, uh, intent, it's not a plan. It's not a plan. So when we speak about intent, we, uh, we speak about the state of mind. Uh, but uh, we doesn't need a, a specific plan, elaborated, written, signed, and adopted. Actually, we don't know about one the conference, but still, no, not of all other uh, planning documents of all of the famous about Armenian genocide. Uh, and we know that uh, this uh, definition of uh, UN Convention was adopted uh, uh, on the base of uh, these two <laughs> genocides. Uh, people took the genocide, the genocides uh, into mind when they tried to elaborate special notion. Uh, but I would like to point <laughs> to draw your attention to the fact that not all national laws adopted. Uh, the same definition uh, actually in France in 1990s. Uh, there was a law about genocide adopted, and according to this law, uh, for instance, so you need to, uh, to justify that there was a plan, not just uh, intent. Uh, but at the same time, the, this law uh, has broadened uh, the number of groups uh, that, uh, that could be recognized as uh, groups uh, to be exterminated, uh, this would be a genocide. Uh, moreover, I would like to draw attention to another point of this uh, notion. Uh, if you uh, read it, you'll see that this uh, convention speaks about genocide of uh, uh, killing uh, such groups of people as religion, uh, ethnic, racial, national. But still, it's not about groups, it's about peoples, a people, nations. Uh, so the main idea of this convention is not to speak about uh, mass crimes, but uh, to speak about the killing a people and how we can uh, con uh, construct, uh, usually peoples uh, are constructed. Uh, on uh, religious, uh, racial, uh, ethnic backgrounds. Now this uh, social theory uh, went uh, further and you ever see these uh, ideas from the constructivist uh, lens, but still uh, this uh, definition is uh, not about uh, modern uh, social science. And it's, it's a little bit uh, of more. Moreover, the main point, the main point is about the final expression it is definition as such. It's the most important point uh, uh, about genocide, to be, to kill people as such, for uh, those they are. Uh, not for political reasons, not for economic reasons, but to kill people as, as such. Um, um, actually, uh, uh, if you go back to history, uh, to new trials, uh, the notion of genocide was not used there. It was another uh, notion uh, of, uh, um, uh, of crimes about humanity, uh, humanity and it was about uh, uh, huge crimes about uh, different people. And uh, the idea of crime, crimes of humanity is not about killing groups, it's about uh, it's more close to popular understanding of genocide. Uh, Kinds of that it means is when we kill a lot of people. Um, so we have 
uh, two different uh, notions and instruments to analyze to understand different um, aspects. Moreover, in 1990s, so when Srebrenica was recognized uh, as uh, uh, genocide, it was uh, recognized not as a genocide of Serbians, it was recognized as act of genocide. So it's quite a useful idea. I don't want to go into detail whether it's possible to uh, 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 to call Srebrenica as genocide or not. But still, it's, um, it gives us an opportunity to widen our language, our instrumental tools to speak about different kinds. Say that, okay, there are genocides of people, for instance, of Jews, of Armenians, of uh, St. Robes, but still some kinds could be recognized as uh, non-genocide of people. But uh, as uh, an act of genocide, when we see that uh, not as much people uh, to kill. Uh, moreover, when we uh, uh, go into academic discussions in genocide studies, uh, actually um, the main field of public discussions about uh, the killing by categories. And uh, actually it... Um, um, uh, it helps us uh, sometimes to put the notion of genocide aside, because actually, uh, according to international law, it's a very, it's a very narrow thing, it's a very narrow notion uh, to kill a people as such, uh, in particular situations, actually it's a very rare uh, situation, uh, even in history. Um, but still, if you want to use the language in order to understand what we're talking of course, we need to develop our notions to understand how they are used and to develop our analytical language uh, in order to, to be accurate with the details. Uh, so, it's uh, my remarks about notes. Uh, about uh, notions, uh, notion of genocide, and about academic uh, language, how to study. Uh, to study. Uh, actually, um, actually, um, my second point. My second point is that even when we speak about the Second World War, about German crimes, it's, uh, uh, not, uh, it's not very easy to distinguish all different crimes uh, this one notion. Uh, and here is um, a very huge problem. Uh, so, look, mm, for instance, uh, Holocaust. Uh, yes, we speak about Holocaust as the main example of genocide. Yes, but still, uh, but still, we should understand that not in all cases uh, Jews that we killed in occupation, we killed uh, uh, during uh, the genocide. Even there are some cases, low cases uh, in France, uh, where, uh, uh, when special cases of killing Jews were studied and, and in general we can say that all Jews were killed uh, uh, because uh, there were some plans against Jews, but still uh, in detail, in particular situations, there could be five different uh, cases. And uh, here is um, uh, very important to understand because uh, uh, how we use the notion of genocide in, uh, in the law. It's not the same how we use uh, the genocide in history. Uh, the second point is about um, partly genocide or entire genocide. Actually, this you know, take Holocaust. Uh, you know that uh, Jews were imprisoned in uh, separation camps in uh, uh, Northern Africa. But according to the last studies, they were not uh, uh, they were not intended to be killed. So actually, Holocaust is uh, an example of uh, uh, genocide uh, first of uh, uh, European Jews. Uh, yes, you can say that in the future, after the victory, uh, people would kill all Jews under the rule of Jews. Yes, of course, maybe it would be. Yes, it's true. It sounds uh, like yes. But still, uh, we, uh, we need to access the real situation, the real history, and to distinguish, uh, to distinguish different points. The thing is about occupation of um, uh, the USA and the war on, or, uh, the war on extermination. Uh, this uh, war is called as a war uh, of extermination, uh, extermination of uh, the USSR. But what does it mean? Um, since uh, the late 50s, 
Russian government tries to uh, to portray this was uh, uh, it's not uh, just a war against uh, the your society the, the war of extermination but uh, the war uh, that led to the real genocide of sorry uh, what's the problem uh, the main problem is about uh, mass atrocities that have never been started actually we don't know the number of people uh, killed in villages Nobody studied, uh, for instance, uh, as occupation terror in um, Russian territories, even in uh, Belarus. Uh, as, um, I know that in 2021, the Special Institute counted only uh, counted all uh, villages destroyed by Nazis only in two regions, in two regions of Belarus. We don't know exactly how many villages were killed, uh, villages were destroyed, and how many people were killed. Uh, moreover, we don't know anything about uh, the attitudes and the real policy towards different uh, Slavic people, especially the Russians. We don't know. There, uh, there is no study of it at all. A profound study when we go from uh, above to, <laughs> to the ground to study the whole uh, situation about ethnic Russians under the Nazi occupation. At the third point. Um, if you take uh, the notion of genocide of Soviet people, okay, yes, there were some historians that uh, had used it before in the late uh, in the tens, but usually they, they never uh, paid too much attention to definitions. Uh, they used genocide as, uh, as a synonym to mass crimes. Nothing more. Um, the main idea of the Russian government was uh, the following. Uh, you, you maybe you remember uh, 2019, 2019 when in uh, September 2019, the European Parliament uh, adopted a declaration on totalitarian regimes and uh, the declaration of against both uh, USSR and uh, Germany uh, for the Second World War. Uh, this uh, declaration was adopted, uh, was proposed by um, Polish deputies, uh, and uh, then Putin decided to fire back, and then he used Poland uh, of starting the second, of provoking the second war. Uh, but it, uh, but it was obvious that the Russian historical policy abroad failed, failed, and of course uh, uh, the idea of uh, USSR that plays a main role in defeats of Nazism doesn't serve uh, as a good image of Russian state. Uh, then it was explained one idea. Okay, it's uh, quite a quotation of one uh, senior politician uh, in the president's office. Uh, he said, uh, he said uh, the following. Okay, um, we are accused uh, for uh, for the Second World War. Now, Jews, uh, Jews are not accused. They are victims. They are primary victims of genocide. Therefore, we should portray ourselves uh, as the primary victims of Nazis. And as genocide is recognized, uh, is thought to be the main crime, we should say that the genocide of Soviet, uh, that we were, uh, that we suffered, uh, the genocide of Soviet people. Actually, I understand that that sounds uh, stupid, very stupid. And actually, you, if you want to pronounce something in, in the initial arena, uh, in cultural ties, you don't need uh, to create any definitions uh, if you want to uh, uh, make your teams uh, sympathize with uh, mm, uh, so people uh, killed under. Occupation, uh, okay, you should uh, tell uh, histories uh, about such killings. You don't uh, need to elaborate any new definition, especially when you don't need any uh, academic graph. But still, uh, this policy was uh, adopted and it was implemented in the, in, uh, the following forms. The first form, uh, of course, they understood that it's uh, quite a weird notion, the genocide of Soviet people, but still. Uh, they started to started uh, regional uh, persecutions. Uh, they took uh, in every region. They started a uh, law uh, persecution against uh, uh, crimes committed by Nazi, and uh, now they are recognized as crimes of genocide. Second is about media. Uh, 
The idea is very simple. It's, it's uh, for all journalists to say it was uh, genocide. When you speak about Nazi occupation, you say it was a genocide of Soviet the, the third point was about uh, um, academia. We used to finance academic researches about occupation, about publishing documents under the ages of genocide. Um, historians were not forced to use it directly, but still, when you are given money, good money, uh, for your studies, for your publications, of course, you'll keep silence. You keep silence, you'll be silent uh, to its uh, propaganda. Uh, of course, uh, after the full scale innovation in Ukraine, it was uh, one of the useful tools to say that in the past we were. Uh, the victims of genocide, and nowadays we are victims, uh, Russians are victims of Ukrainian genocide in Donbass, and we want to prevent it. But still, um, uh, there is another political idea uh, under this uh, genocide uh, notion. If you take uh, close to what they say, especially uh, special speakers like Alexander Diogo or Igor Ryakov, they try to say that genocide is not about, about people who were directly killed. Uh, in occupation, but still they are about uh, people who uh, died in Leningrad during the siege. Mm, yes, of course, Leningrad was blockaded, and there was a huge discussion about the responsibility of Zhdanov, of Soviet people, of Soviet uh, authorities uh, for providing uh, food uh, supply to the population of this city. Nowadays, as I said, it was a genocide. Therefore, you shouldn't blame uh, political authorities for, for it. Moreover, the trying to portray uh, uh, Femayan of uh, in Arhangelsk, in uh, Yakutia, as uh, part of genocide of Soviet people. Why? Uh, what makes uh, this logic? And why it's much more. Sometimes it's much more than just a uh, politicization of weapons. The idea about uh, 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 the idea about uh, the nature of the war against the USSR. Uh, Nikol Yakovlev uh, took some documents published that had been published by German historians in 2000-2010 about so-called hunger plan. And the planet was a document, a set of documents uh, elaborated in May 1941. And, and in these documents, Rosenberg and other uh, chief Nazis tried to outline what to do after the victory. And they said that the main idea is to prevent Russians, ethnic Russians, to restore the empire. In what way? We need to somehow to cut the, uh, the, uh, uh, the number of Russians and to organize family. You know from memoirs that uh, this uh, idea was uh, on table, uh, even in December 1941 in Rosenberg, but actually Rosenberg played a little uh, role in uh, providing a real occupation points. But still, uh, the, this idea was discussed. And what is the manipulation of Yakov? Uh, it's not only the manipulation to say that the plan that there was uh, when Nazis targeted ethnic Russians to call uh, the plan against uh, Soviet people, but about uh, the very easy idea. Uh, it's impossible to take a plan to say that all killings uh, and all suffering uh, after it uh, was uh, real, uh, real, real, the result of this plan. We need, uh, you need to study it properly day by the day. Institution by institution, how it is organized, and here is uh, the main problem. Uh, one of the main problem that uh, very often uh, we speak about genocide with people who do not understand uh, uh, how this notion was elaborated even in uh, international law. They don't study the historical reality or current reality. It doesn't matter. Actually, but uh, in, uh, and they want to only to use uh, a notion, uh, but not to analyze the situation. And my final uh, remark will be the, uh, the following: that of course now nowadays uh, this term is uh, quite politi politicized, and, and actually there are a lot of genocides nowadays, <laughs> real or invented. But still, when we speak about crimes, the main idea is about uh, not to distinguish but to understand uh, the minds of perpetrators, the criminal minds. 
And um, in historical uh, policy, the main idea is to pay sympathy to, to victims. Uh, and therefore, I suppose that uh, discussions about notions, uh, they should be, uh, should be in academic sphere. But still, uh, the main point is not in public sphere. It's not uh, it's, it's, to, it's to criticize uh, uh, the public awareness, excitement about genocide and crimes. It's, of course, such events are too emotional, but still uh, the main uh, dignity of uh, historian or academic is to speak against emotions. Uh, if you take any genocide emotional, you cannot study it. That's all. Thank you, Constantine, especially considering that um, you made a large part in creating this uh, round table and uh, you argued, founded your views. Um, well, and I think all four perspectives um, offer us possibility to start the discussion. It, uh, it is especially interesting because these perspectives are partly professionally defined. Yes, the view of a historian, the view of a position of um, a specialist in uh, sociology studies, in memory studies, and so on. Unfortunately, I don't see... Uh, ah, no, I see already Suren with us. Uh, and I hope uh, Suren also will join discussion. So uh, after the questions that were partly answered by uh, Georgi already, we can uh, proceed to, to discussion and to the questions that we defined as the second part with also with a uh, possible agreement, but I expect more disagreement around the term and uh, especially around um, what Suran has mentioned already as, well, excuse me, I can define it, define it as a political will yes, in implementation of the convention and um, the remark of uh, Constantine that intention is different from the plan. Uh, so we can take these two points as our polar, yes, points for, for the discussion. Mm. And our first question, yes, anyway, is uh, about comparative studies of different types of mass violence. Should we call it all genocide or genocide studies? Uh, and what is the ground for comparison in general? So, Please. Uh, I think maybe Suren would like to, to yeah, talk yeah. first. Yes. Thank you. I, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's uh, in the very uh, essence of genocide studies. You cannot study genocide only from one perspective. Because, yes, genocide is historical crime, uh, historical crime and we usually uh, take insights from uh, historical research, from histories of different genocide, but at the same time, genocide is political crime because people who make this decision and who uh, kind of mastermind and, and kind of uh, 
um, oversee the, the very process of its implementation of genocide are politicians. That's why we, we should find some kind of juncture between political science and history. Also, people who participate in genocide, they're, they're ordinary human beings like me and you and like uh, oh, everyone, you, you, anyone you can see on the street. And so here uh, we, we should use some methods from sociology to understand, for example, the motivations of these people, to understand the context of, of these or that societies. Uh, and the genocide is legal term. And that's why we need uh, legal sciences or I don't know, law uh, again to, to, uh, to um, kind of uh, contemplate the, the, the very, uh, the very uh, the essence of, 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 the, of this crime. And not only this, but also we need literature, literary studies, to understand how we reflect on what happened and how uh, it uh, it is presented in the literary work, genocide also also deals with uh, with economy because at the end of the day, genocide is a great, uh, a gigantic plunder and, and redistribution of economic resources. So that's why I think it's not question to dis discuss, but I think it's it's one of the axioms of genocide studies. You 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 need to have group of people you need to have a, a collaborative research on on genocide because again it is it, it has so many facets it's, it has so many faces that it has so many aspects that one science is not enough to research and understand what genocide is uh, thank you Suran and I hope our round table discussion setting the questions also can define some perspectives and after discussing this question we have already one question from our listeners uh, i will read it later so uh, what can colleagues say um about, well, also about comparative studies, uh, maybe not only considering that um, it's a phenomenon of complex nature, but also of different wheels that try to play in this phenomenon. Well, I just, I, I just may, yes. yeah, I may reflect on the, on, well, I already, at, at, during my first speech, I already uh, highlighted my points about this, yeah. uh, all this uh, issues, but, uh, well, the, the further discussion just uh, revealed some other aspects. And uh, first of all, we have convention, yes, yeah, so that uh, when you are dealing with the genocide issue, you have to somehow to tailor your arguments according to convention. The convention was uh, deliberated in 48, yes, so quite long ago. And there, is, there were uh, different, uh, different uh, cases of mass killings which could not, would not fit this convention. Just, just this, uh, this circumstance should push us to the idea of reconsidering the convention as a tool it's it's a legal tool, but it's legal tool which was designed for during well special period for special purposes uh, under special circumstances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you look at genocide studies development since uh, let's say end of 80s and 90s, and then you will see that uh, the cons there is a number of concept of concepts of genocides proposed by different acad academics by different lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that it's time to reconsider the, uh, the Genocide Convention. I don't mention here the capacity of UN as an organization to proceed with the cases of genocide like Srebrenica or, uh, well, of course, there is a tool, the, 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 uh, the court in Hague, and then we they can use it, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at uh, Cambodia uh, case, that, yeah, that's still on. It still have to 
prove that it was genocide, just killing 5 million people in one country, and then they have to prove that it was genocide, that it can be qualified as genocide. And it lasts for for how long? It's all, or, or already lasts for uh, not less than two decades. So uh, that's, uh, once again, going back to initial point, that yeah, the, the compar comparative studies, whatever, whatever, they are already on. There is a lot of comparative studies of different genocide, different interpretations of genocide, et cetera, et cetera. So um, my final point that if you speak about UN Convention of 48, we should speak about this historically. And when we speak about application of this convention, definitely it's it's definitely it's appeal, it's a need to reconsider it, especially taking to part in taking into account its political limitations. We just remember that Soviet Union insisted on exclusion of social groups from the uh, genocide definition. So but so I, I I don't understand this kind of uh, kind of obsession. That's like uh, I, I was I was really uh, impressed by how Ukrainian scholars permanently stubbornly wanted to adjust the uh, the Holodomor case to UN convention. That's like uh, like this in this discussion was that well intention. So they did a big job to find intentionalist explanation of this. They failed to find the the clearly defined intention to kill uh, Ukrainians as as a, a ethnic or national group. So they, they did a lot of different um, strategies to convince people that that exactly within the framework of UN convention that it was genocide according to UN convention. Just forget it. it is that now it's, we have a huge <laughs> genocide studies and then you do not need intentionalist uh, explanation. You just look at the results. If you lose no more, no less than 10% of population, just because of deliberate action, regardless of their, was their plan to kill them or not, that should be called genocide, of course. But, uh, well, just what what is about UN Convention here? Nothing about UN Convention. So the, your, your question about comparisons, about uh, comparative studies, etc., it's absolutely, yes, it's uh, grounded. But we should take into account the the new changes in the situation, the new cases, which were definitely genocidal by their nature, but they cannot cope with the UN Convention. Thank May you, Georgi. Yes. Victor, yes. it's uh, the short for, for you about uh, yeah. intentional studies. No, no, in, uh, in this particular case, uh, sociologists are much uh, closer to lawyers. Uh, not only because historically our discipline is very tightly connected with the legal studies and half of our classics for lawyers, uh, but also because there should be some kind of responsibility in playing with terms. It should be some kind of limitations of your research imagination that uh, that tells you just take the concept from legal framework and then use it to define your research object. And if your research object does not really fit to that concept, then concepts should be changed. It works usually when we steal concepts from each other. It's fine. But not when we steal concepts from UN convention. And then asking for politicians all around the world, let's change convention. It doesn't fit our interests anymore. Because in legal framework, there is something called presumption of innocence. In your studies, there is no such thing as presumption of innocence, because uh, as a researcher, you do not hold responsibility when you are accusing someone who died 300 years ago. But when you are a lawyer, you are actually responsible for accusing people in something that is going on right now. And by the way, in terms of Cambodia, there was intent and it was defined and there were clear evidences for intention. So there is no such thing as like fog of war that doesn't allow us to see through the minds. So what I say here is it's very important not to transform legal concept in metaphor, in some kind of metaphorical usage 
Imagine, for example, that you will take not a genocide, which is actually heavy itself, it's a crime of crimes, but you will do something with this metaphorical transposition uh, calling genocide everything, but not with the genocide, but with another concept, another uh, accusation, rape. And then you say, no, it's clear it was this, even if it doesn't fit the framework. No, you can't do this. Because um, no matter how strong your research intention, no matter how you want the concept be changed and reconceptualized, uh, there is some kind of clear definition. And lawyers, in terms of clarity, are much more advanced. They have to fight their words. Uh, otherwise, you are opening a door for not just a research proliferation of the term, but for politicization, uh, for weaponizing, uh, for false accusations uh, that will be made based upon your research work. That's why it's for me, it's very important that in terms of like labeling something a genocide, we don't forget that there is actually a clear definition of term and the argument that, oh, you know, that term was produced in 1945. It's so outdated. It does not sound very convincing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor. Actually, uh, yes. May I contribute? Yes, Constantine, yes. Uh, yes, uh, uh, actually, I would <laughs> I would mention that actually I, d I don't see, I don't understand why genocide is considered uh, as, as a crime of a crime and why and why uh, the crimes of against humanity is something better. Actually, for me, it's <laughs> it's quite the same. It's quite the same in a personal way uh, about emotions about uh, it's, it's uh, something bad, but still it's uh, different crimes and we have different terms. The main idea about genocide that is, yes, of course, was elaborated in, uh, uh, in a particular historical situation, of course, it uh, has a uh, very narrow meaning, and uh, of course, there is a problem about uh, group is thinking because now that we uh, we take many social uh, situations, events, uh, and uh, act us in a different way, but still there is a notion. And the, my, my idea is uh, actually is, uh, is very simple. We need to understand what means uh, genocide, international law. It's impossible to say it, genocide, it's possible to say uh, in general language genocide like crimes. And, uh, perhaps you can say about uh, the Nazi occupation uh, that it was uh, uh, the genocide politics. But actually it's confusing. The main idea of genocide is, is this uh, my idea is not to attribute any quality to the policy. It's about uh, the targeting uh, uh, of, uh, of a group, of a nation, of a people, uh, and to, to kill it partly or entirely. And uh, it's a very, very narrow, narrow crime. In a metaphoric way, it's possible to say in uh, political reality, but still it's not about academy. We have uh, a lot of uh, notions how to distinguish different crimes. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Michael Mann, uh, American so uh, sociologist, proposed uh, uh, special, uh, a special a list of uh, a list of uh, uh, notions from homicide up to genocide, and he pointed out different levels of uh, killing people, ethnocide, politicide, and, and so on. And uh, we need such expressions uh, not only to provoke moral excitement, we need it to understand, uh, to understand reality. It says that all uh, that if uh, five million people are killed, it's a genocide. It means uh, that we can confuse different uh, mass crimes. Uh, in this, uh, these terms, our discussion about notions is not about just notions. It's about uh, understanding of different uh, mass crimes. Uh, to kill entirely, to kill a nation, to kill a religious group, to kill a political group. It's possible to say that uh, Stalinist uh, repressions uh, is, this is quite, um, they were ugly and Holocaust was uh, ugly. Okay, you can say in this way it was bad, but uh, what do we need to say that it's the same or to say that uh, they're different, uh, to understand the violence? We can say that uh, Israel and America and uh, the USA are democracies, of course, 
but still we understand that uh, these countries are different democracies and it's uh, important. Uh, the same is about uh, cotton massacre. Uh, cotton are the places where civil killed uh, 22,000 uh, 22, of uh, Polish prisoners of war. They were Polish by citizen. Was it a genocide, an act of genocide? Of course, no, because they were killed uh, not as Poles. They were killed for uh, the inability uh, to recognize the new political station. They were picked out of other prisoners of war. Uh, tens, uh, uh, 200 prisoners were released, released by Soviets. And the 2,000 were killed because uh, they understood that these uh, people would never be loyal. Here was the point. You can uh, blame it, uh, this crime as a genocide uh, in, uh, in uh, public debates, but actually it's not an academic way. It's not uh, the same as uh, uh, Holocaust Armenian genocide. And, um, here is my point. Uh, to develop different uh, notions, uh, why, do we, uh, why many people speak about genocide? Genocide is not about uh, crimes against humanity. Actually, uh, Lemkin was born nearby Lemberg and Lebhardt. When we this term of um, crimes about uh, humanities was uh, born nearby Lemberg. Uh, they were both Jews, they were uh, uh, you know, juridicians, and they wanted uh, somehow to provide uh, uh, tools how to define uh, uh, Nazi crimes, how to speak, and how to prosecute people. And there were two different ways how to think. One way is to uh, speak about uh, ordinary people, and uh, it's uh, the idea of Lebhardt. And the second thought is about groupist thinking. Uh, to speak about groups, it's about Lemkin. Uh, now that we too much uh, inclined to speak about groups, uh, speaking about mass crimes, uh, but still it's not uh, the only way how to understand and how to uh, define it. Well, I I would say, uh, yes, just a moment, Georgi. Uh, I would say that contemporary academic society um, is somewhat in between these, uh, well, um, uh, strict understanding and explanation and producing metaphor, metaphorical meaning. And I think after um, I will give floor to Georgi, we can uh, turn a bit to, to the role of academic society community in understanding of genocide as a term and as a way of uh, political conscience. Georgi, please. Yeah, I just would like to get back to my point about the limitations uh -huh. of UN Convention. It is exactly designed for the use in uh, in uh, judicial practices, international law, etc. So uh, when we try to use this convention in other disciplines, in uh, academic disciplines, even sociology or political science or history, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it is in many cases uh, the, the, its limitations uh, comes to the fore, and then uh, it becomes sometimes absolutely useless. And moreover, what uh, as Victor mentioned that that we should not use it as a metaphor. It is exactly used as a metaphor, and then this metaphor in many cases, and uh, in in this case, it, it's very it, it, it's well it's paradoxically of course, but. When this this metaphor sustained by the uh, five points of uh, of uh, UN Convention, and then uh, it's uh, we have a kind of mix uh, of uh, like post more mix of uh, of notions and semantic uh, deviations uh, when uh, we well initially 
we take UN Convention, put it, uh, try to uh, tailor the historical evidence accordingly to this convention, and then use this convention exactly as a metaphor and the term genocide as a metaphor. And then we, we, put, uh, we put conclusion before uh, premises, and then we have, we have a result. This is exactly what I'm try trying to speak about, is that the, the legal terms is for legal practices. The, uh, in this case, uh, there is a mul multiplicity of disciplines where legal terms either unapplicable or can be uh, distorted uh, and used arbitrarily, extremely arbitrarily, including what Victor mentioned that by politicians, of course, genocide of Donetsk people, genocide of, uh, of uh, South Ossetians, et cetera, et cetera, used by politicians uh, without <laughs> any references to any kind of academic research. And Thank it you. is a bit of what uh, Suren also has mentioned. Yes, am I right, Suren? Uh. Yes, and, and, and I wanted to, sound, uh, to add something. You know, in contemporary genocide studies, I, I see that more and more research are focused not only on this uh, very narrow uh, definition of genocide, but other forms mm -hmm. of uh, mass violence also included in this, in this research. Understanding that these boundaries are so, are so vague that uh, to understand the very nature of violence, you should research all of them. Because you know, we have the concept of crimes against humanity. We have the concept of concept of uh, war crimes. And yes, I understand that these categories are not interchangeable, but genocide is now usually considered to be a crime of greater magnitude. And, and yeah, genocide exactly. can be usually uh, usefully viewed as the most extreme form of crimes against humanity. For reasons that that, uh, that it's difficult to, to explain, crimes against humanity does not have same resonance, the same stigma that has become associated mm -hmm. with genocide. It should, I think, but it doesn't. And again, at the end of the day, International Criminal Court prosecute all uh, these three crimes, the crime of genocide, the crime of against humanity, and, and war crimes. And perpetrators of all these crimes They are uh, they, they uh, uh, and and the punishments would be the same. I think more or less to concentrate on this very word, but maybe to take other interchangeable definitions and and uh, and uh, use them in our contemporary uh, comparative research. Again, not to uh, focus only on on. I'm not use this word, but only on, on accepted kind of genocides. Thank and you, Suren. Yes, it is what, what uh, uh, this was also a point of Constantine, who yeah. offered to, to um, make differences, to point, first of all, to differences. I think one of the problems can be contemporary simplification of thought in inside the academic community. Could it be so? That yeah. they, uh, they try to, to keep together all these differences and coin something under umbrella term. Well, uh, Suren, Suren uh, has internet problems. And, and... Uh, yes, I just... <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe you can switch off the camera. Maybe yes, it maybe can it would, help. It would... Yes, maybe it helped. Yeah. Yes, and uh, as a very good example in this in the same time equation, we have um, uh, the question from our colleague in in uh, uh, Zoom chat. Um, 
from professor at university of uh, state university of parana brazil and he writes in the case of brazil there is an indiscriminate use of the term genocide mainly associated with political parties and university propaganda, which includes the idea of genocide in Palestine promoted by Israel. How can ideological activism distort the concept of genocide and influence policies of memory and international justice? Uh, I can I can offer the author of this question to take the microphone also if you like uh, to to define maybe uh, your question. But I think the question is more for Victor. Oh, okay. Just because I am the only one with the camera switched on right. Now. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's a very good question, by the way, uh, and it goes exactly back to our discussion with uh, colleagues right now, because uh, there's a problem metaphorization that happens when scholars from different disciplines are taking legal terms such as genocide and uh, or crimes against humanity and take it not critically but as a tool for their own research. They commit a crime against conceptualization because they are taking the term and transform it into metaphor. And when it becomes a metaphor, the ontological weight that actually goes beyond every legal term is not there anymore. Now you can call this genocide and that genocide and that genocide in legal terms, you need to prove, you need to have like a very solid proof to say that there is an intention, that there is collective body, there is someone who should be accused and punished for that. When it becomes a tool for research and a part of research imagination, it doesn't work anymore. We have a genocide and a counter genocide, for example, if you read the uh, comparative genocide studies during the last 10 years. Or we have a Jean-Paul Sartre who is taking the concept of genocide and applying it to the history of colonization just in order to accuse the United States of the genocide. And then ideological parties and political players are taking it not from convention and not from a set of legal definitions. They're taking it from research. They're taking it from your papers. And then you say, okay, of course, we are doing it just because as a metaphor, it's a very useful and convenient tool. But no, political players who are doing it in order to, for example, accuse someone in genocide, in order to attract people uh, saying like, look at those atrocities and so on, they take it from you. So that's why for me, it's not just a play with concepts. Yes, in the academic field, we play with concepts. That's part of our theoretical job. But that game has consequences. This game has implications in the field of policy and in the field of sometimes political violence, where the concept of genocide is not connected anymore to any legal definition, intention, standard of proof, beyond reasonable doubt, conspiracy, and so on but now already purified and refined by academic work is now becoming a very heavy weapon, a weapon of war. So for me, it's always a question of responsibility of every particular scholar who is saying, no, I'm not responsible for that. Convention is convention. We're just taking the concept and use it as a metaphor. But then the next player in this chain, we'll take it from you and we'll use it with a very, very heavy consequences. That's actually also the answer to the question, how come analytical concepts and purely conceptual models are becoming a base for a very strong hate speech? 
And um, that's actually my question to post-colonial theory. But that's another question, how theory is becoming an ideology fed by legal and very well-defined concepts. Thank you, Victor. Oh. And Constantine oh. also can make some points. Yes, I, I have two it's... points. Uh, yes, so one point is uh, about the history. I would like to answer your question about uh, Gaza and the use of genocide, uh, this notion, uh, uh, the historical point. Uh, we understand that uh, sometimes people use political axes, so not politicians, but political axes to use uh, the notion, the matter of genocide or provoke uh, moral awareness about particular situations and they think that this will lead to some good results. Uh, but still, uh, in uh, 1944, uh, the Red Army liberated uh, the uh, concentration camp of Maidan in Lug. And uh, there was um, a execution post small and they said that 3 million people were killed here. And it was this uh, number was official, official for several decades. And many people, especially uh, those who tried to, uh, to say that there was no Holocaust, tried to attack me. And, and partly they, were, uh, they had some truth. Uh, just, uh, not just, of course, uh, not 3 million people, but uh, 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 80,000 people were killed at Maidan. But what the outcome? Uh, the outcome was uh, that uh, the sense that nothing uh, dangerous, uh, there was no big crime happened uh, at Maidan. But still, it's not true. It was a concentration camp. It was a death camp. Uh, the two thirds of uh, died or killed people were Jews. Uh, there, were, uh, uh, there were a lot of atrocities against other nations yeah, uh, at Maidan. But still, uh, when you say in the beginning, uh, three millions, two millions, the same as about Auschwitz, uh, you try to portray crimes, uh, huge crimes, much more dangerous than they are. And it's a problem. If you lie in the beginning, uh, who will believe you? in 10, 20 years, when it appears uh, that, uh, that it was not genocide, that not uh, 5 million people or 3 million people killed. The second point is about, it's, it's, it's quite a different point, it's about political activism in global arena, I suppose it should be discussed uh, later in another discussion, but still, uh, you know that, of course, uh, there is a globalization, and we live in a global world, and of course, uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, turn a uh, deaf ear towards crimes, but still there are a lot of people who are trying uh, to uh, represent themselves in public arena. Uh, with no responsibility to the real situation. Many people who don't uh, live in Duke and Russia, who live in another part of the world, uh, I uh, think that uh, uh, they understand the situation. They're trying uh, to say something, but not thinking about the reality of this particular world. The same is about uh, the war here in Israel. There are a lot of people who are trying uh, to say something, not understanding what happens in the ground and not thinking about what they can say or cannot say, how to understand, uh, what are the sources. Uh, and here is more about uh, positioning the, themselves, it's to create the reputation, is to uh, play your own game in uh, American, Europe, and Australia, and Brazil, uh, to represent uh, yourself uh, in your country, your specific uh, specific uh, circles, uh, left wing, right wing, centrist. I don't know. It depends, of course. It depends. But uh, sometimes we should be should be careful about such uh, self representations. Sometimes uh, political activists uh, 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 think too much about their role and. Uh, uh, don't think about what happens in the town. 
And here is the problem about global worlds and about worlds and about how uh, now this politics works. Um, thank you, Konstantin. And uh, it's really quite complex, yes, approach to the problem. And it is also partly connected with our last question because uh, some parts of other questions we already uh, touched upon a bit. But the last question, which, uh, for example, Victor mm, mentioned as another story, is still uh, mainly undiscussed, and it is about how colonialism and genocidal policies are or could be connected. Um, it's a pity uh, the internet of Suren, for example, uh, prevents him from joining right now, but this question is uh, also for you, for uh, Victor and Konstantin. Konstantin, go ahead. Uh, oh, Konstantin. Maybe he wants to smoke too. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now it's his turn to smoke. Yes, sometimes behind, I can't smile. Behind the screen. Yes. Uh, yes um, uh, actually, um, uh, could you repeat your question? Um, uh, 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 it is, it is uh, the ultimate question of uh, from our list about the possible or actual connection between colonialism and genocidal policies or uh, colonial studies and genocide studies. Let's, let's differ these yes, two um, aspects. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, mm, it was your question, yes. by the yes, way. Yes, it was my question. Yes, it was my question at um, this point, because uh, actually uh, it's uh, connected to the notion of genocide of civil people in what way. Uh, if, we, uh, if we try to assess the arguments uh, that uh, elaborated by Igor Yakovlev in his book, it's the only book, is to justify the genocide of third people. What, uh, what uh, he's doing? He starts his book with uh, some cases of colonial violence uh, in Australia in, in the US census that uh, uh, look, uh, now that they are recognized as genocides. And they were uh, crimes uh, not uh, like uh, Holocaust, of course, but still now that they are genocidal. Then he says that uh, Soviet territory was uh, but, uh, understood uh, by Hitler as his new colony, like India. And uh, they used the ideas of colonial violence, uh, colonialism, to colonize Eastern Europe. Even the general plan also is quite a colonial plan as well. And uh, here is uh, his comparison to say that uh, look, uh, uh, in Australia, just uh, several hundred people were killed, and we uh, name it uh, as uh, genocide, but uh, more than seven million people were deliberately exterminated uh, in the USA, uh, occupied the USA. And why shouldn't we uh, name it uh, as a genocide? And uh, here is uh, quite uh, his uh, understanding is quite close to the second uh, big historical discussions in Germany at uh, the beginning of, of the consequences about Holocaust and uh, genocide. And, uh, and there was a big discussion about that, uh, uh, to, to say that um, colonial violence is equal to. Uh, genocide, uh, and, uh, then to say that no, no, it's uh, you're trying to underestimate the uniqueness of Holocaust and so on. And uh, here is uh, one of the points uh, is uh, about how to compare, how to speak about general things and how to see some uh, similarities. Uh, 
But uh, here uh, I want to draw attention that people who never understood such discussions about colonial wealth, about uh, Holocaust and how uh, so on, try to use it as a political tool. tool. And uh, this political tool uh, serves not the idea of uh, taking responsibility for, uh, for uh, violence of the past. Uh, they use the colonial uh, discourse, uh, post-colonial discourse, uh, in order to, to secure self-victimization. And it's quite uh, a case, it's quite uh, an interesting case how authoritarian regimes could use uh, 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 post-colonial uh, instruments, uh, rhetoric tools, in order uh, to turn them uh, into uh, something different. Uh, so it's it's my point. Thank okay. you. Uh, <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, I think I will... Victor has another opinion. Uh, no, 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 it's uh, pretty much uh, very similar. But um, what, what I want to say, it's actually going back to the Georgi's uh, comment. When he's talking about uh, genocide as something inherently connected with the colonial violence and the words of colonialism and genocide as almost synonymous, that's totally not true. Um, just let me remind you that the very original definition of genocide given by Lemkin was first inspired not by Holocaust, but by Armenian genocide. At the moment of Armenian genocide, Rafael Lemkin was a student of Lemberg University. He was shocked uh, by all those evidences published in newspapers uh, of mass killings of Armenian people. And for him, uh, the very term genocide uh, was about uh, repressive regimes that would be called today probably totalitarian, uh, that are actually nominating some group living on their sovereign territory as a scapegoat. So for him, genocide was about scapegoating. So when he produced that legal framework in his book, he actually took this intuition, that axiom, as a starting point. <clears throat> and for him, <clears throat> that uh, right for intervention and desuveranization of a repressive authoritarian or totalitarian state that is scapegoating and destroying some particular ethnic, racial, uh, whatever, religious group, was self-evident. It was not about colonialism. Uh, it was not about colonial violence. It was about totalitarians. What happened in 1968, when the word genocide and the concept of genocide was first used as a metaphor and then, then uh, redefined, reconceptualized? But one person, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who suggested totally different uh, worldview. He said that actually, yes, Lemkin with his definition and all that UN convention in 1948, we know all of that. But what was the Second World War, says Jean-Paul Sartre in his brilliant speech. Uh, everybody says that it was a war of uh, warriors of light against Nazi regime. But it was actually a war won by colonial powers, which means that colonialism actually won in Second World War. And he's drawing a picture of colonial violence as a genocide number zero. For Lenkin, genocide is a Holocaust and Armenian genocide. For Sartre, genocide is what Germany and Schutztruppe did in Namibia against people of Guerrera and Nama at the very beginning of 20th century. So he's hijacking the concept of genocide, just as Georgi suggested that we need to do in order to do this kind of comparative studies of genocides, and using it as a tool of anti-colonial critique, precisely against uh, the United States and its war in Vietnam. By the way, Israel at that time was actually benefited from uh, from that reconceptualization because uh, Israel and its international legitimation was pretty much based on anti-colonial discourse because colonialists were British Empire. What happened after that? If you look today 
at uh, left radical media, for example, the Gray Zone channel, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mata, who are trying to present current war in Ukraine and in Israel in very Sartrean terms. For them, and they use exactly the same uh, structure of right. Weltanschauung. For them, there is such thing as evil empire called the United States, which is trying to impose its world order, colonial order all over the world. And only few countries like Russia, China, and Iran are trying to resist to that global neoliberal empire. Thank you, Jean-Paul Sartre. And, uh, but those imperial forces are having uh, their colonial satellites like Ukraine and Israel. And that's why it's the United States, the country which is running those genocidal wars all over the world, using their colonial allies, Zelensky and Netanyahu. And they are committing genocide because they are colonial powers. For Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mata and many other left radical intellectuals, genocide became some kind of feature that distinguish American praxis all over the world as a part of American neoliberal policies. But thanks God, those colonial satellites have to face a strong pressure from national lib liberation movements. And for them, national liberation movements that resist genocidal policies of American praxis are Hamas and self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Lugansk. So in this worldview, with the four clearly distinguished stores, uh, layers, imperialists, uh, axis of resistance, um, colonialists, and national liberation movements, genocide became kind of weapon of war, and it became something that they can use, thanks to Jean-Paul Sartre, in their anti-colonial rhetoric, which is strongly anti-Israel and pro-Russian. And then you look, for example, at research of uh, Daniel Gleiser, who is uh, trying to trace what parts of Putin's propaganda are most powerful and uh, well uh, accepted by people outside of Russia. And that's exactly that trope. That's exactly that rhetoric figure of genocidal wars of United States in Ukraine and in Israel uh, that was taken as a clear source. That's why I'm saying that when we are talking about genocide as a metaphor, as researchers, we are sometimes are producing weapons uh, for people like those um, very peculiar media characters. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Victor. So we have, um, well, to say, uh, simplification of narrative in inside the academic community and picking up uh, quite familiar discourses through, through colonial studies, so to say, and uh, it that's why, that's why, that's why my message. the best. Exactly. That's why my message mm -hmm. to all my colleagues, please go back to lawyers, go back to legal language, go back to theory of law, uh, because if we play with words, abandoning all possible criteria for conceptualization and calling everything a genocide, uh, it's actually exactly the crime against conceptualization. Uh, it's not like a free floating research imagination that allows us to do whatever we want with, with a concept that actually has a very strong legal implications. Maybe that's why this responsibility for using words in some particular ways is very important. And only lawyers, only people who really study theory of law can be this in, in this particular case some kind of orienteer uh, for scholars from humanities field. 
Sorry for and being a bit emotional. <laughs> but it's also, well, it's quite emo an emotional topic. And uh, it's also in some parts a point of Constantine uh, about, uh, well, weaponizing, yes, the complex uh, phenomenon into one single uh into one single propaganda slogan i would say and nobody i, I guess uh actually nobody of these uh academic activists uh would return back to loyalists uh because they would lose this weapon nobody would reject such a weapon yes now actually i would like to uh, contribute and, uh, to tell one story because for yeah. me it's not Thank it's you. not only yes it's not only uh the question about simplification and it's not only the question about theories that forces you uh, the force you to jump to conclusions without any reality but it's more, more important, it's the general problem of many intellectuals, especially uh, um, those who work in cabinets, is that they, um, uh, they use their concepts, their theories, their understanding of the world, uh, of the world in, order to, uh, in a way that they deprive uh, themselves of reality. I give you one example here in Israel on Haifa. I had a small talk with one woman. She worked for uh, local council and she's a deputy, a Latvian. She asked me where I came from. I said from Russia that I don't support uh, the aggression against Ukraine and so on. And she said the following. Uh, that, okay, yes, I understand. It's uh, this, this guy's in war against uh, Ukraine, Putin should have started, but still uh, there is another side of the model. The side is that uh, Ukraine fights for America, and, the, uh, and America is uh, the main evil in the reality. Uh, actually, I was uh, too shy uh, to continue this uh, <laughs> uh, discussion, but actually uh, the, the only practical result out of her theory was that I should return to Russia and to join Russian army to kill Ukrainians. The only result of such such is a thinking when you say uh, that there is uh, that this uh, this particular war is something less important than uh, uh, your theoretical understanding of the global process. It means uh, that uh, you says uh, what other people should do. And of course, uh, maybe she didn't want somehow to abuse me, but still it's a subject in this way. And actually, uh, yes, of course, I understand it. She lives by your, her own reality. But her own reality and her own imagination is quite uh, different from what many people do live in uh, reality. Uh, the same as about the history of the Holocaust, uh, about uh, not understanding of reality and the way that they think, actually. Uh, the main role who played uh, uh, in the justification of Holocaust and other Nazi crimes were uh, scientists uh, from biology and medicine. Um, uh, Dr. Mengele is a symbol of such scientists, but it's a very good symbol because uh, he was on a rank in Auschwitz and he had a right to distinguish who should uh, be killed. Uh, today and who will uh, be forced to work. Uh, and uh, he made his own decision on the ground of the science and his own imagination. And it was not uh, an arbitrary decision of Nazis who should be killed uh, here in Holocaust uh, in this particular uh, group of uh, prisoners. It was uh, the decision uh, after the name of uh, science. And here's a very good example uh, how intellectuals uh, could serve uh, such policies uh, when we when we live much more in our theories and don't think about practical consequences. 
The same is about my point about police, uh, political activists who, who are trying uh, to position themselves, but they don't bear any responsibility for the outcomes of their role votes. As uh, if this practice uh, is uh, it's okay, maybe it's okay as uh, part of the modern art. Why not? But uh, <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's much more than a modern art. It's not just uh, artistic uh, gesture. And uh, such cons consequences about uh, public intellectuals are rarely discussed. Uh, and about ethics of uh, your uh, words about situations that you don't know, you don't live. And when you're trying to uh, somehow influence people you don't uh, really know. Yeah. I suppose that in this global world, uh, such as this should be discussed. So, well, the it's... only question is, is it global? <laughs> but uh, I think uh, with this optimistic note, we can um, finish our discussion maybe anybody would like to make some questions comments to share the ideas and uh if if not i would like to thank our presenters a lot thank you for quite productive discussion and thank, uh, to thank our listeners also. Thank you.